Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audio download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Allen. And Allen is spelled A-L-A-N for those that don't know. Again, audibletrial.com slash Allen. For all of us, it's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. This interview is part of a series I recorded at the Internet Summit in Raleigh, North Carolina. Today we talked to Christy Olson, head of evangelism for Bing at Microsoft. For over a decade, Christie's led in-house digital marketing teams at Microsoft, Expedia, Harry and David, and agency teams at PointMark and PointIt. Today on the show, we talk about Bing search marketing, accessibility, and the impact to SEO. We also get into voice as a uh, search method and a user interface for that matter. And we also talk about trust and how um, Microsoft thinks about trust um, as it relates to their consumers. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Christy Olson. Christy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I was curious um, what your path was to become head of evangelism for Bing at Microsoft. Well, it's a bit of an interesting path. I've been a search practitioner now for about 15 years. I was the first full-time employee at Microsoft Managing Search on behalf of MSN and a couple different business groups. And I absolutely love search. Did it for about six years at Microsoft before leaving the company to get some experience outside. (laughs) I always find it great to not just work at one company, but have a breadth of experience across different industries, different verticals. And I saw the job opening come up where they're Mm -hmm. looking for somebody that had the expertise in search that could speak to what a practitioner would need to know, but is also to the leadership and management teams of how do you then take some of these high level trends and implement them across the board. And so I was Mm -hmm. very, very fortunate and lucky to just have the opportunity to become the evangelist. That's awesome. That's awesome. And we are here at the Internet Summit. So if if you hear background noise, (laughs) listeners, and I I know you're talking about accessibility here. Can you tell us why do you feel that is so important right now? Well, accessibility has been around for quite some time. Right. Um, the ADA is celebrating its 20th year mm-hmm. of existence, so Americans with Disabilities Act. And in the Americans with Disabilities Act, it actually required that anything considering a public accommodation, which websites are considered a public accommodation, is accessible to anyone of all different abilities. So one of the things that comes up with this is the fact that most web developers and most search engine optimizers, SEOs, don't really think of accessibility first when they're developing a site and content. Most of us are pretty able-bodied. We don't have vision issues. So you haven't had the experience of trying to navigate the web using a screen reader. And so for me, it's been a really important thing to discuss and talk about because I know some individuals that have vision issues Mm -hmm. and they've come to me going, I'm trying to do this thing and the sites are just horrible. The experience is definitely suboptimal and subpar. And so talking to them and understanding their experience Experiences. Right. It makes sense to start bringing up and leveling the conversation with people within the industry of why is it so important? How many people out there do have a disability of some sort and why we should start thinking about it first and foremost and right. not as an after the fact process. So what I'll be discussing today really goes into how should you be thinking about that and some of the core areas that really SEOs should be including, I think, into their audits. Now, not everybody agrees with me. I'll actually be having an article coming out probably in the next (laughs) month to two months on uh, search engine land or else marketing land that's going to come against um, several core people in the SEO space who actually completely disagree with me about accessibility being an organic search issue. I'm right. um, saying that it's 100% web dev and I disagree with that and several other people also do. So we're going to be interviewing some lead SEOs within the industry why we all think one way or another right. and then actually speaking to some of my peers within the search engine and why accessibility why it might not be a ranking factor within Bing mm. or Google following the accessibility guidelines will help you rank better. Right. So I love the controversy. <laughs> I do too. I <laughs> and was, the tension. I, I was shocked yeah. when I um, I posted an article on my personal LinkedIn just yeah. talking about why I think SEOs should right. be understanding the basics of accessibility based on the Domino's case that went up to the Supreme Court last mm-hmm. month and that was not. The Supreme Court opted not to hear it, which essentially meant 
yes, your website is required to comply by the ADA. The web content accessibility guides are what you need to be adhering to, right. and they weren't. And in that case, several people, I made the case, you should understand these principles for these reasons. Several people are like, no, that's a dev job. That's not us. Devs are 100% responsible. And so we've argued a little mm. bit back and forth on Twitter, which is what Twitter is great for. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, let's take the argument to the next level. Right. Let's, let's outline the case why. Mm. And the number one thing I heard back from several people was it's not a ranking factor. And if you're in the search space, right. everybody adheres to, like, these are the ranking factors. It's the most important thing. Right. To get to my side of the case, and I love talking to our ranking engineers and our indexing and crawling engineers. Right. So if you imagine a search engine uses a technology like a bot that right. crawls a website to understand the content and the context behind a website, a screen reader might also be a technology right. <laughs> that is trying to read a website right. and help provide audioly what you can't see visually on the site. So while it might not be a ranking factor, right. the concept of a screen reader and a device that gives the auditory clues right. is very similar to a bot right. that right. is trying to scan the website in order to give the search engine clues right. as how to rank and index that content. Some people might even say they're the same things. <laughs> Some people might. <laughs> Then I guess therein lies the uh, the controversy. The, the controversy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the debate. It'll interesting. be interesting to see how it goes. I love it. I love it. And so, I mean, it, it would logically flow that it may not help you in your page rank, but it's just good SEO practice to do the things that would make it more accessible, your content more accessible. Correct. So yeah. it, some of the things are very simplistic, and we're not talking rocket science here. Right. We're talking about, let's say you have dyslexia. Having your font centered versus right or left aligned. Right can make it more difficult for them to read, somebody to read. Wow. So, I mean, we're, we're not yeah, even talking yeah. like low vision, even just individuals with dyslexia, how you have your fonts aligned on the page, the type of font you choose. Right, that would uh, be I am getting a little bit older. My <laughs> arms are getting shorter. I tend to notice, like, my head comes back, my arm gets shorter. Font size matters. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I have that issue. You can tell with my little readers on right now. <laughs> so. Font matters. Yeah. Other things are interesting is when you think about a screen reader, the titles mm. and how you have the structure of your page organized. Yeah. It's almost like going back to uh, your elementary school days of using a bibliography. Right. Right. And understanding how does content flow? Mm. How do you write it? How do you organize it in a way that makes sense? Because a screen reader can jump from title to title to title within a page. And some of that also goes back to basic SEO. You're supposed to have one title tag, H1 title tag per page. Right. Well, if you have everything as an H1 title tag and nothing is in the the different structure of right. H1, H2, H3 mm. for the different types of headers, it can make it difficult to understand how is the content organized, how does it flow. Well, right. So, I mean, some of this is... It almost seems like <laughs> rudimentary at some common level. Common sense. Right, and common well, sense. And yeah. ADA has been around for 20 years. Right. So the other thing I love to say huh. about this is it's not just great for your business because you're making sure that you are accessible to the one in five people that have some sort of disability. Yeah. <laughs> stat. Great stat. Uh, yeah. But it's also the law. Right. So if you have a carrot, there's also a stick. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I want to ask you as well about voice and search. And how fast is voice growing? And where do you think it will head in the future? Because yeah. that's another way to access the web, essentially. Yes. And so voice search has been growing in popularity substantially over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say, and yeah, I saw that surprise look. I said decade. It's been around for for a while, but it's not been great in terms of how well the different tools and technology can understand what we say and provide back that spoken response up until about the last five years. And part of that, if you think about it, um, you have Moore's Law where processing power doubles every 18 months. The same thing applies to processing power, but also right. natural language processing and the technology on the back end to understand accents, understand cadence of speech, and understand just language in general and be able to process it better so they can understand the nuances of how I speak from the Pacific Northwest versus you versus right. somebody from the South, the Northeast, and to be able to respond. So voice has been around for a while. The other area that's really been driving growth is adoption of, let's look at the Amazon Alexa, mm -hmm. the Google Assistant. Mm. and uh, Google Home. Right. When you think of the, the devices, everybody in this building has a smart digital Something. assistant right. on a phone device, oh, yeah. whether they use it or not, it's there. But really the proliferation of smart home speakers mm -hmm. and how many people have purchased them and start to integrate them into their home and using it more frequently has helped drive the growth and adoption. I think it went from the first year that the Alexa came out, it was something like 1 million units were sold. And if <laughs> I remember correctly, last year at Christmas, it was something like 9 million units 
wow, yeah. That's, that's, Which yeah. Uh, you start thinking about it, you're like, hmm, that's actually pretty substantial. Right. So as people purchase the technology, mm-hmm. they use it more, they become more comfortable with it. Right, right. What was four and five years ago, like using your voice to order a pizza, is pretty common today. Yeah. And you get used <laughs> to it, and so you use it more, you utilize it more. The more you use it, the more it has data to learn on. Right. Right, right. And understand how you use it. And then the more you also use it and the more brands and companies will create additional skills, bots, et cetera, to help you engage better and to get the information you're looking for. Interesting. Interesting. So really long-winded answer. No, it's good. It's good. I like the detail because it's not something that, one, I've covered on the podcast before. So it's hopefully new content for listeners. But as I think about marketers and what should we be thinking about or doing or considering, do you have any ideas when it comes to understanding voice discovery? Like what should we be thinking about? Yeah. So first off, I was one of the co-authors and researchers on the 2019 Microsoft Voice Report. Mm. So you can find it aka.ms backslash voice 2019. Sort of goes into five five different areas of voice search, everything from usage to adoption to trust to v-commerce, and how some of these shifts and changes have been happening over the last several years, really diving into different sections. I don't go into in this voice report what brands should do to adopt their strategy for voice, because that would be a whole separate other white paper. (laughs) Um, But at least it'll give you an idea of the adoption, the usage, how consumers are thinking about voice, Mm -hmm. where they might have concerns on privacy and trust, and then how you as either a brand or a company should be thinking about leaving it at that. Now, as a brand, what I can tell you, coming from the the search engine Bing, (laughs) we have our digital assistant Cortana, Mm -hmm. which is integrated into Bing and across Microsoft's tools and platforms. Mm. When you ask a question of Cortana, she goes into Bing to pull out the search result. So Mm. she pulls her answer a lot of times directly from Bing. So this is where there is a great intersection between voice and SEO. Yeah. Because with Google, and sometimes depending on Amazon, Amazon sometimes pulls from their own data set. Sometimes if it's a product, search it's them. Sometimes it's Google. Sometimes it's Bing. So the search engines really are the intelligence platform powering a lot of these digital assistants. Hmm. So if you are a brand and there's questions your customers are asking, you have the opportunity to optimize what's called a featured snippet, which is the spoken response for many of the questions that get asked to digital assistants. Oh, wow. Um, It's basic SEO. Yeah, yes, for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Just the interface is different. The interface is different. um, And we see that there's shifts in how people are talking and engaging Mm -hmm. with search on voice. It's more conversational in nature. We're seeing the queries get much longer. Text queries used to be three to five words in length. Voice queries average between five to 12. They tend to have a question word or phrase in them. So you can start to see the questions that people are asking. They're Mm. not just looking for template links on a page. They're looking for an answer. And then where I tell Mm. marketers and brands their opportunity, and I actually covered this last year at the Internet Summit, is going from answer to question action. How do you understand the question that they're asking and not just providing the answer, but when there's an appropriate action that the person is looking for, <laughs> how do you use tools and technology to get to that next phase? And a great example of this would be like me tonight here in Raleigh. I'm going to want to go to dinner somewhere. I might ask Cortana or right. Siri or Alexa, where can I go to dinner for three people at seven o'clock that is vegan? Right. <laughs> and it might give me a list of restaurants. Great. That list of restaurants, a good first step. The mm-hmm. next step, though, is if I discover there is a great restaurant across the street, get me the reservation. Right. Let me book it. So if I am either open table, right, <laughs> a reservation platform, <laughs> Resi, you, Resi yeah, yeah. you might want to right. have an integration to mm-hmm. allow somebody to take that next step. Yeah. And book right the reservation if you're a brand maybe i want looking for a hotel and there's a marriott right, right there across the street and i'm asking right. about a hotel integrate a tool or technology like a voice skill or a chat bot that the digital assistant can engage with to take that action step yeah. and that's sort of where we're going to be going in the future is tools and technology coming alongside voice and digital assistants right. to get you to that action phase hmm. I love it. I love it. Well, you you mentioned the big trust word a little bit ago, and trust is a big issue across many technologies today. I don't need to name them. How are you and Microsoft thinking about earning trust with people that use your products? Yes. So one of the core areas on trust does come back to value exchange. Mm -hmm. So people are willing to give you access to data and information if they get something back. Right. That's the first area on trust is understanding, like, are you providing the right value based on the type of information coming back? And marketers, we get that, right? Because you want to be providing value, not just creepily hiding in the the back, collecting everything that they give you. 
So. Yes and no. It's interesting. <laughs> we're actually um, doing research right now that we're coming out with March time frame. We're mm. starting going down the path of doing surveys and gathering more data and information right. that while marketers seem to understand that there is a value exchange, understanding where the interplay in that yes. value exchange, yeah. because I'm trying to figure this out. I haven't figured out what I'm going to call it yet, but I'm essentially trying to come up with a grid of you have a lot of data and minimal data, mm. high privacy, low privacy. And where do you fit within that grid? Because a lot of marketers want to give have all access to the data. Oh, mm. and then you have a third component of value exchange, mm. low value, high value, like right. highly personalized. Yes. Not a lot of personalization, not mm. a lot of use of AI. They want to have a lot of data. Mm-hmm. They don't want to have to do a lot of work. So low personalization, right. which might be on the low data side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's great, except for that's a disillusioned phase. Right. That you need yes. to have for the more data you want access to and the more information, you need to have you're going to have to get a lot more value right. out of that. Right. So that's one component of trust. Microsoft actually has six privacy and trust principles that we mm. have in play that we look at really to engage with our customer base. Privacy and trust are definitely top of mind within Microsoft, not just right. Microsoft advertising and Bing. And so a lot of it is understanding how we rank trust, privacy, data security in order to make sure that they have access to the right information Mm. to know that we are giving them value, but they have control and transparency of how we're using that data. So we have really strong solutions internally at Microsoft guided by brand safety, data security, fraud protection, platform integrity, and transparency so that you as a user of any Microsoft tool and platform can log in and see what data we're using, how Mm. we're using it, and then opt in or opt out. Right of the different scenarios, especially as Microsoft a whole, it's looking at what are we required to do and what should we do and how do we make sure that we're going above and beyond, Right, really. And then as we think about advertising, because again, we're marketers, a lot of us here, Mm -hmm. the other thing that's interesting on this as a point of view that we're we're balancing between is the fact of transparency and control. Right. And then how do you take the data then and use it for things like advertiser targeting? Mm -hmm. Right. And making sure that there is a good value exchange because we know that there is a greater need for trust and desire for personalization. Mm. So how can we in the long term create solutions that coexist Mm. from an advertising perspective to give people access to how their data is used, but also making sure that they have the transparency of what we're using it for and how it's getting access to any point in time. Cool. Cool. Well, Christy, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me and thank you very much for your time. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me. If you're new to marketing today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart and this is Marketing Today. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. You can get a free audio download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Allen. And Allen is spelled A-L-A-N for those that don't know. Again, audibletrial.com slash Allen.